for the next case, a 66-year-old male with hearing loss found to have a retrotympanic mass. Okay, so we have uh, axial and coronal CT. This is the patient's subsequent uh, post-contrast uh, MR studies. Okay, which of the following is the best diagnosis? Number one, glomus tumor. Number two, aberrant carotid artery. Number three, dehiscent jugular bulb. Number four, persistent stapedial artery. Number five, cholesteatoma. Let's start the timer. Okay, again, the coronal image I think is very helpful for the diagnosis. Okay, so the majority of you said glomus tumor. And the answer is a glomus tumor. So the second uh, part of the question, all the following are true except the arterial supply is via the ascending pharyngeal artery and its inferior tympanic branch. The floor of the middle ear cavity may be eroded. There are four types in the Glasscock-Jackson classification. May present with hearing loss. Complete surgical resection yields cure. You can start the timer, please. Okay, so a lot of... Uh, answer choices. Okay, so we have a, a spectrum of different uh, answers. Um, so the, the correct answer is the floor of the middle ear cavity may be eroded. Typically, they, it should not be eroded because that is one of the hallmarks uh, of this um, entity. Um, they, remember, arise from glomus bodies, which are typically located on the cochlear promontory. But remember, that's where the glomus, I'm sorry, that is where um, Jacobson's nerve is going to run. And typically, there will be the glomus bodies along the nerve, but we often see it at the cochlear promontory. And these patients will present with a reddish pulsatile retrotympanic mass. On CT, we want to see a round mass with a flat base on the cochlear promontory a large glomus tympanic and fill the middle ear cavity. But again, the key thing is that the middle ear cavity should be intact. They can be ISO on T1 and hypo to ISO on T2, again, avidly uh, enhancing. So this is a high riding jugular bulb. We can see it here again, dehiscent. And again, this is something that the, our ENT colleagues can appreciate on, uh, on exam. This is a aberrant um, internal carotid arteries. If you look at the axial image, we can see that the caliber of the internal carotid arteries narrowed and lateralized. Here it is on the coronal image. Um, so this is something to really be aware of. Again, mimicking a uh, glomus uh, lesion. This is a patient who had a cholesteatoma. You can see a soft tissue mass filling the hypo um, tympanum and mesotympanum. The key here, when we look at the promontory, we can see a small dehiscent, uh, dehiscent uh, focus. And this was found to be a cholesteatoma. The persistent stapedial artery, we'll see this linear soft tissue again along the cochlear promontory. Remember that the stapedial artery should regress before birth. If it doesn't, the middle meningeal artery will not develop. So that another way of looking uh, for identifying a persistent stapedial artery is to look at the skull base where we'll see a absent foramen spinosum. The other thing that we can see is that the horizontal segment of the facial nerve may also be enlarged. 67-year-old male with rapid onset of facial paralysis. In this particular case, the history is key. Here's some axial images, again, temporal bones, again, at early in the morning. Okay, more um, CT images. Here's the patient's post-contrast MRI. Some coronal image and a T2-weighted image. Okay, so here are the key images. The best diagnosis is number one, Bell's palsy. Number two, perineural spread of disease. Number three, vestibular schwannoma. Number four, a facial schwannoma. And number five, a facial hemangioma. So remember the history. Okay, if you can start the timer. So we have our axial image, the CT, and here's our uh, coronal, I'm sorry, axial T2-weighted image. 
and here's the post-contrast T1 weighted images. So we have 60% uh, of patients said Bell's palsy, and then about 40% uh, said facial schwannoma. This is a facial hemangioma. So like here, history is very key. This was a rapid onset. So when we think of a rapid onset of a facial palsy, we think of a Bell's type of palsy. However, with a Bell's type of palsy, we're not going to see this enlarged uh, geniculate ganglion region. Remember, the nerve typically uh, may be slightly enlarged, but typically it is not. Which of the following is true? Facial hemangiomas arise from the adjacent temporal bone, sensorineural hearing loss or pulsatile tinnitus or common presentations, are more common than facial schwannomas, occur predominantly in the region of the geniculate fossa, and may have coarse calcifications. You can start the timer, please. Okay, so the majority of you said uh, occur predominantly in the region of the geniculate fossa, which is the correct answer. So what's the etiology of facial uh, hemangiomas? Well, they may arise from the facial nerve itself, the vascular plexus or adjacent temporal bone. They typically present with a facial palsy. They can be progressive or can be acute, mimicking a Bell's palsy. It's one of the reasons that we may image Bell's palsy um, if uh, it doesn't uh, uh, resolve. These typically occur in the geniculate fossa. They can be hyperintense on T2 with foci of low signal. They typically um, avidly enhance, and they have this stippled or honeycomb calcification. Um, especially with larger lesions. So this is the typical honeycomb appearance where you, um, of a facial hemangioma, again, at the level of the facial, uh, uh, at the level of the geniculate ganglion. So here we have, again, widening of the geniculate ganglion. We can see on the post-contrast images both the area of the geniculate ganglion enhancing as well as a component within the um, internal auditory canal. So this was a facial schwannoma. This is another uh, example of what we can see on the post-contrast images. We can see enhancement of the geniculate ganglion. There's a little sliver going into the internal auditory canal. Again, it's not enlarged, so this should be a Bell's palsy. Okay, finally, the last case, a 48-year-old male. I promise it's not a temporal bone. 48-year-old male with a left neck mass. So two CT images. Here it is in coronal and sagittal breast, appreciating the dimensions of the lesion. Okay, we're neuroradiologists. We typically don't look at ultrasound, but I thought I'd throw this in. Okay, so which is the best diagnosis? Number one, cystic hygroma. Number two, branchial cleft cyst. Number three, hemorrhagic fluid collection. Number four, an abscess and number five, a cystic nodal metastasis. So again, the sagittal and axial and the ultrasound uh, image. If you can start the timer. So again, number one, cystic hygroma, number two, branchial cleft cyst, number three, hemorrhagic fluid collection, number four, abscess, and number five, cystic nodal metastases. Okay, so we had a branchial cleft cyst, and the next best uh, response was a cystic nodal metastases. Well, the answer is cystic nodal metastases. So in terms of branchial cleft cyst, we shouldn't really see um, calcifications um, within it unless it's uh, infected and we get dystrophic uh, calcifications. Here's another ultrasound uh, image through the uh, patient's uh, thyroid gland. I'll give you a minute there. All of the following are true regarding papillary thyroid cancer, except number one, approximately 10% are bilateral. Number two, most likely thyroid tumor to have nodal metastases. Number three, more likely to invade vessels. Number four, characteristic histologic features are somoma bodies. And number five, 30-year survival rate is 95%. If you can start the timer, please. Okay, so regarding papillary thyroid cancer. Okay, so most of you said most likely to invade vessels, which is true. That is typically more likely seen with follicular carcinoma. So remember the, the different types of thyroid cancers, papillary, follicular, these are differentiated, 